Uh, get your Bible out. Did you bring a Bible to church? Amen. Bible is always a good idea. Hebrews chapter 9, we'll study the Word, then we'll get into our prayer time here in a little bit. Has everybody had a good day? Who had a bad day? It's the best way to end it, right here. So, would you like for me and your mom to end it for you tonight here? We can do it. We can do it. Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, studying the office of mediator, um, we are pretty much, we've been studying First Peter in chapter 3. The Bible talks about Christ who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. So the question is, what is Jesus? Why is it important that he's at the right hand of God? We studied the right hand. We studied the significance of it. Then we've been studying Christ as the mediator, the one mediator between us and God. And there, there needs to be a mediator. There needs to be somebody uh, who will speak for us. That is Christ's office as when we pray, we pray through Jesus Christ. The Bible does not say anything anywhere about praying through or to anybody else. Some who say, well, I pray to St. Matthew, or I pray to St. Joseph, or I pray to St. Mary, uh, St. Jude. Does anybody know, you know, they have a patron saint for just about everything in life. And I was taken aback at this, but I guess it makes sense. St. Jude is the patron saint of what? Huh? Travel? St. Jude? Well, I don't know what Catholic church you go to, but it was obviously the wrong one. St. Jude is the patron saint of hopeless causes. That's why St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Because, and this is sad to say, but, and I'll be honest with you, they've done good things. I get that, okay? But children who were, had different diseases that could not be helped any other way were sent to St. Jude as a final, let's try this. And, um, and, and again, I will say St. Jude Hospital has done a tremendous thing of advancing the knowledge of children, diseases, cancer, d leukemia, things like that. Le uh, Melissa and I grew up with a, with a boy who had leukemia. And he was, hel he's still alive to this day because of St. Jude's Hospital. And so, you know, for that, that's great, okay? But St. Jude is dead. I don't even know, well, I do know who he is. He wrote the book of Jude. But... The bite, not even Jude himself mentioned anything in his letter about any of the other saints being a mediator, being someone that we pray to. Nothing like that. You don't see anything anywhere in Scripture. So if the doctrine of praying to other saints is as significant as what the Catholic Church says... It seems to be all alone in saying that because none of the apostles, none of the prophets, Jesus did not mention it. Nobody, there is no mention in scripture of praying to anybody who is already deceased. Nothing. So we have Christ being the only mediator. So when we pray, we pray through Jesus Christ. He is the one who lived our life. And he knows our heartaches, he knows our temptations, our trials, he knows our pain, knows our sufferings. And so, who is better equipped to carry those things to God the Father except Jesus Christ? But then, Christ is the mediator in the opposite direction. 
God desiring to speak to mankind. And we already learned in Exodus 19, and we're going to go back there in a little bit, that when God speaks directly to mankind, man runs in terror at the voice of God. The voice of God Almighty in heaven, man cannot handle that. And the Israelites, who were God's people, said, tell God stop doing that. We can't take it. And so, as Christ is the mediator of taking our request and our petitions to God... So then Christ also is the mediator carrying to us the word of God. Since you're there in Hebrews, let's start out in Hebrews chapter 1 and then we'll go to Hebrews 9. Um, let's read a couple verses in Hebrew one, Hebrews 1 and we'll go to prayer. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse, diverse simply means diverse, different, man, different manners, spake in time past unto the fathers, by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Let me give you a, a picture of what that looks like. At night, we have multiple lights shining down on us from the heavens. We have all the stars. We have the lesser light ruling over the night, which is the moon. All of those stars in all of their brightness and the moon in its strength. In a full moon, you can kind of see your way to walk around in complete darkness. But it's not really light that you could read by. It's not light that you would want to live by. It is, in fact, lesser light. So even though you had a multitude of lights in the night sky... They were all together, not very bright. In the daytime, however, we don't have multiple lights shining down on us. We have one. But that one light supersedes all of the other lights. In fact, where do all the stars and the moon go during the daytime? They're still there. That left, they haven't gone anywhere. But you can't see them. Why? Because there is a greater light that outshines every one of them. And that light is, is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Uh, Malachi 4 says he is the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So when you, when you picture that in your mind, here is God at time past speaking to us by multitudes of prophets and the law itself and the lesser light, Moses' face and so on and so on. But still and yet, that leaves man in darkness. But now in these last days, now that the sun has risen on us and shined the light of heaven to us, to mankind, we now see plainly and not as they did in the Old Testament. So there's just a little picture of that for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, open our eyes. Thank you for the sunlight. Thank you, Lord, for taking each one of us out of the darkness that we were all in and bringing us into your marvelous light. The Bible teaches us that Moses' face, after having been with you for 40 days, his face was shining so bright that the Israelites had to put a veil, a veil over Moses' face. They could not handle the light. And yet the glory of that light was to be done away with and now we have an even greater light than that of Moses shining into our hearts and by that you have opened up our minds and our hearts to the mysteries the things that were kept secret from the foundation of the world now in these last days we see very plainly and clearly we know plainly who the son of god is who the messiah is who the savior of mankind is and that's because his light is shining in our hearts and father we ask god that you always shine the light of God, not only to us, but also through us, so that we also shine as lights in this ever-darkening world. Father, bless your people tonight, bless your word, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Is it of your opinion, the same as me, that the world is getting, in fact, darker and darker and darker? Okay? Um, 
And on part of me, I mean, yes, we mourn the fact that we have come so far away from God in this nation and in this world. However, there are people now, though they have never seen the true light of God shining through God's people, as this world grows darker, they're going to see it. And they're going to see it coming through God's people. Because not only did Jesus say, I'm the light of the world, but he looked to his disciples and he said, ye are the light of the world. So that light shining from heaven to us, but then through us. Because we have the Bible, but does the world read the Bible? They will if they read it in your life. And that's biblical. So Hebrews 1 telling us that in the old times, God spoke through the prophets. Now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Hebrews 9. The Bible talks about, uh, and we, we, I covered Hebrews 8 and 9 last Wednesday night, just in a general way. We were just kind of going through those two chapters. But I want to focus on verse 15 of Hebrews 9. For this cause... He, meaning Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament. So, what we're seeing is, before in our study, Christ was the mediator expressing or telling God the things that we wanted God to hear from us. The message from us was being carried to God the Father through Jesus Christ, who is the mediator for us to God. But then God desires to speak to mankind. And it's already been shown in the scriptures that God himself, the Father, speaking to mankind from heaven is not something we can handle. We couldn't take it. Israel's already told us that. So the office of mediator in the days of Moses was set up so that what God had to say, he could tell it to Moses, Moses could tell it to the people. And now we have a better mediator because ours is still alive after 2,000 years. Amen? So our mediator is ever liveth to give us the words that God speaks to mankind through Jesus Christ. And of course, that's why the Bible makes Jesus Christ and the Word one and the same. They cannot be separate. They are not separate. If you say you believe Jesus, but you don't believe the Bible, what do you believe about Jesus? Is Jesus going to tell you something that's not true? Is Jesus going to stutter? Is he going to make a mistake? The answer is no. So we have to believe that what God has given to us in the form of his written word is exactly what God wants us to know. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament... They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So we have our family here from Salt Lake City, Utah. They are not Mormons. Okay. I don't think I ever asked you. Are you guys Mormon? I don't think I ever asked. But they say they're not, so we believe them. And here's the problem with Mormonism. Okay. So we have the Bible telling us that Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. Joseph Smith then came and added another New Testament on top of the other two Testaments that were already there. You had the Old and the New, and then you have the, the real New Testament, according to the Mormons. So what's the problem with believing that God sent yet another book from heaven to give to mankind? Who can tell me why we as Bible-believing Christians should reject outright the Book of Mormon? Tell me why. Give me your reasons why we should reject it. Yes, sir. We're not going to add any more, right? Revelation 22. Jesus, God allowed John to live after all the other apostles had died. John was the last one living, and we're talking about some 95 years after the birth of Christ. We have, we have the Apostle John. He's the only one out of the original 12 left. And then Jesus delivers to him the, the revelation. 
the, the testament of the last days. And then at the very last chapter, Revelation 22, he said, John, John, write this down. I testify to every man who taketh away from the words of the prophecy of this book, I will take away his name of life. And he who adds to the words of the prophecy of this book, I will add unto him the plagues that are written. And it's very simple contractual language that once that that book of Revelation finished the entirety of the New Testament, God sent his own son to tell John, John, tell everybody this is the last word right here. There are no more after that. And I've had, I've heard guys teach that, well, John was, Revelation wasn't written in AD 95, it was written around AD 60. Why would they say that? It's because these people believe that they're still getting prophecies and words from God so that they can't, they're not bound by not adding words to the Revelation because obviously other letters by, of Paul were written after they say the book of Revelation was written. In other words, Revelation shouldn't even be at the end of your Bible. It should be somewhere in the middle of the New Testament somewhere, chronologically. And obviously God added words after that. So if I say that God told me to tell you something, then you better believe what I say because it's going to cost you. Or some nonsense like that. But it's very clear that God wanted it known that after the book of Revelation, he's done adding words to the contract. So, when you got saved, you got saved by the New Testament, the whole of the New Testament, and you don't agree to any books being added after the book of Revelation, do you? But you know what? It's not just the Mormon church. I talked about this in Pastor Mike Online one time. This TV show, It's Supernatural, with Sid Roth. Sid Roth had a guy on there that says that... He was allowed to go to heaven and he saw a big, vast library in heaven. And it was a library full of other things that Jesus had taught and said. And they were all written in books. And this guy's just amazed. He's looking through all these books and he's, oh, this is awesome. This is amazing. This is really something. And Jesus promised this guy that he could pick any two books from that library and bring them down from heaven with him to share with mankind. So the man reaches and grabs a particular book and Jesus said, not that book. Well, why? He said, the world's not ready for this one yet. Put it back on the shelf. But they're getting ready. So what I'm going to do is I'm, at a later date, I'm going to call you back up here and then I will allow you to grab that book and bring it back down because then man will be ready to receive it. The name of the book was John chapter 22. John chapter 22. John chapter 22. You notice that the Gospel of John ends with chapter... Chris, this guy has hundreds of thousands of people that's convinced that this really happened. And that at some point in the future, God is going to allow this man to come down from heaven with another gospel. Dun, dun, dun. But it, it, that's, what, that's what the name of it was, John 22. Okay? So, and my thing is, why didn't, and it was done in front of a studio audience, why didn't they jump up and rip this guy's heart out of his throat and say, you false prophet devil, you. We'll all go to prison for killing you. We just did the world a favor. But no, they applauded and cheered and they all went, ooh, ah, boy, we can't wait for this. You see the setup? Boy, we can't wait for you to come and bring us this other chapter of the Gospel of John. It's a setup. So it's not just the Mormon church doing it. The setups are taking place everywhere where church after church is denying the final authority of the written word of God. So if they teach them, God could be still talking. Really? 
That's a setup for another gospel coming down and fooling mankind. So it's not just the Mormon church. Um, but that's, that's good. Uh, can anybody give me another reason why? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Paul told the story of Joseph Smith. Though we, or Joseph Smith, or an angel bring you any other gospel, let him be a curse. He almost told it verbatim because Joseph Smith said, I saw an angel come down from heaven. And he pointed to this place where these, these um, golden plates were to be dug up and found. And they were written in reformed hieroglyphics. And nobody has ever seen them. And I am the only one who, have, with the special magic glasses, can decipher the, the, uh, the words there. And I'm going to give them and have them written out. And it'll be another translation. It'll be another testament of the Bible. And you're exactly right. He, he did. Joseph Smith set up a religion based exactly on what the Apostle Paul told everybody to watch out for. So all these poor people who got duped by the Mormon missionaries into believing that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and the Book of Mormon was another testament of Jesus Christ. These people obviously were not grounded in Galatians chapter 1 to begin with. They were obviously, because if, if you're, gra Sterling, if the Mormons come to your church, your house tomorrow and say, would you like a copy of the Book of Mormon? Get back to them. With a 22 sized hole in it. <laughs> Here, you can have it back, okay? He's not going to fall for it, he's grounded. He knows it's nonsense, right? If you know the rules and you know how God establishes things, when they come by with this stuff, that's easy for us. But there's people out there who we have Bibles everywhere in this country, but they don't know anything about them. And the Mormons are really good at not converting Buddhists and Muslims, but they are very, very good at converting weak people lazy church members am i right okay that's who their target audience is people who know this much about jesus and the bible so that they can lie to them and say here's another testament so that now makes joseph smith a mediator along with jesus christ have you ever seen a painting done by mormon artists of God, Jesus, and Joe. You ever seen them? Sure. They practically exalt Joe Smith on even terms with Jesus Christ. Okay? So again, learn enough so that you're not duped like these other people are being duped. Amen? Turn to Exodus 20. Here's what I was saying a while ago about God's voice that if somebody is telling you on the internet or somebody's telling you on Trinity Broadcasting or somebody's telling you on the radio that they heard God's voice ask them how far they ran before they stopped crying like a baby because that's what Israel did when they heard it Exodus 20 um, now, if you listen to Pastor Mike online today, uh, I was talking about the seven trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9. And tomorrow, I'm going to, we're going to go back in scriptures and look at the symbolism of the trumpets that he was talking about in Revelation 8 and 9. And Exodus 19 is really one of the first places that, that we're taken to because Revelation, or excuse me, Exodus 19 God is going to meet with Israel at Mount Sinai. And so he tells Moses, uh, tell all your people, uh, wash your clothes for two days, come not at your wives. In other words, purify yourselves. And then on the third day, I'm going to meet with you. So he actually gives a time prophecy of when he's going to do it. And then the Bible says they all saw God. Not He was, he was veiled behind this thick cloud. But he's, this cloud comes down upon Mount Sinai and the whole mountaintop is on fire and they hear the sound of a trumpet exceeding loud. And the ground is rumbling and there's fire on the mountain and like a 
billowing pillars of smoke rising up from the top of Mount Sinai. And then all of a sudden, here's the voice of God giving them the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. And when God stopped speaking that, verse 18 of Exodus 20, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. That would scare any of us. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. It wasn't that they didn't want to hear from God. They didn't want, they could not handle hearing God's voice. It did not sound like Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston has never scared anybody. Unless you don't like the NRA, okay? Um, I used to, I'll, I'll sidetrack. When I was little, we lived in a duplex. And where my mom and dad and Melissa lived, we lived in this half of the duplex and we had the upstairs. And the, my bedroom was over the lady's part who owned the duplex. And she rented that half of it out. And I would lay in bed at night and I don't know who this man was, a visitor friend that she had or whatever, I don't know. I was little, but I could hear this man talking down there. And all I heard was this deep, booming voice. And I thought, that is so cool. God is underneath me in that lady's house. That is so cool that God comes to my house. I thought it was neat. It sounded like God to me, but it wasn't God. When God spoke here, they ran and they said, stop. So verse 20, Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off and Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was. So Moses now is acting as a prototype of Jesus. God is wanting to speak. Man cannot bear the voice of God. So we have the one who is both God and man. He's not half God, half man. He is fully God and fully man. So he is the one whose voice we can bear. But if you think that God's going to say something to mankind and Jesus is going to say it differently... That's where you're wrong. Because Jesus made it plain that he only comes to speak what his father has given him to speak. We have many examples of that in the Bible. We have in Jeremiah. When Jeremiah the prophet was called, God said, Jeremiah, open your mouth. I will put my words in your mouth and then you go speak what I say. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel was handed a roll of a book and it had writing on both sides. And he said, e Ezekiel, eat this roll. And Ezekiel ate it, tasted like honey. And God said, Ezekiel, now that I've given you my words, you go speak my words that I've given you. Um, who else did that? John. In Revelation 10, John was the little book that was in the hand of the mighty angel was given to John. And he said, John, eat this book. And he ate the book, tasted like honey. And then he was told... For you're going to prophesy before many peoples, nations, languages, and tongues. And that's exactly what's happened with the book of Revelation. It's gone all over the world. So the idea that Jesus is saying something different than God is not true. He's saying exactly what God said. No more and no less. So we must believe that what the mediator is telling us is in fact the very word of God. If it's not, then he's not a faithful mediator, but he is. Amen? He gave us, if Moses, if Moses being not God at all, was faithful enough to give to the people of Israel every single Hebrew letter and word, and without fail, all the, all the arguments about the, the, um, the copies of the Old Testament books and the New Testament books, 
out of all the discrepancies that you find in the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, you don't find hardly any of them in the Old Testament. The Jews did a top-notch job of making sure that what they found in those clay pots at the Dead Sea was matched exactly the oldest Hebrew manuscripts that we had before that. And we know beyond any doubt that every word of God of the Old Testament has survived all these years. There's just no art. That's why there are no missing verses in the new Bibles from the Old Testament. There was no disputing what God said in the Old Testament. It's the New Testament that everybody's up in arms over. But we know and believe that as Moses was faithful, Jesus was much more faithful being God himself coming to us with God's own word. Uh, Exodus 31. Look there. Verse 18. He gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Not only did he write it down, God himself wrote it down. Moses did not write any of those commandments. Chapter 32, verse 15. This is the second time Moses turned down and went down from the mount and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other, were they written. Again, written with the finger of God. In Revelation 5, we have a book in God's right hand. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. So the book that you see in Revelation matches the description of the two tables that you see in Exodus 31 and 32. And someone pointed this out to me. I never saw this before. But I want you to do the math on this, real simple math. So Moses comes down and how many tablets, how many stone tables does he have? Two. And yet each stone tablet is written on two sides. So how many pages does he come down with? I never thought of that before. And I used to say, God, why didn't you show me that? And God said, I just did. The guy wrote you an email. So I don't complain about it anymore. Okay. Turn to 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3. Or you can look up on the screen. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. How many tables do you have in your heart? Four chambers. Those are the four tables, the four pages that God himself wrote on the two tables of stone. I went, how come I never saw that? But I'm going, that's good. So y'all, the first people in the whole world know that, other than the guy that, okay. I like it when God's people are looking. Amen? I like that. But see, here's the thing. So Christ is mediator of the word, but since we are of Christ, Christ is in us, we are in Christ, do we not also bear that same ministry? Because Paul's right. Most people are not going to read a Bible except they read it written in our hearts amen you then to okay you guys were asking me about being in salt lake city okay do you know how many fundamental bible believing friends they have in salt lake city <laughs> they're children <laughs> okay but you're there and for a time being, God's keeping you there and there's no way out of it. So you are in that place, a living Bible to everybody you meet and everybody you know out there. Now, it could be like Peter and John in the early days of the church where 
people are reading your lives and 3,000 people get saved all in one day. Well, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Or you could be like Ezekiel, who God said he gave him the role, he ate it, and he, he said, now Ezekiel, go speak to these people. I'm not sending you to people whose language you don't understand. You're going to speak their language because you're one of them, and you're going to tell them everything I said, but chances are they're not going to listen to a word you say. But, Ezekiel, I sent you to them nonetheless. Because, and I was talking to uh, Jason Cooley, who was street preaching the other day, and he had, he said the sodomites came unglued on him. And he said, he said, I used to handle them pretty well. He said, but they got the better of me. I said, you're getting old, Jason. That's how it is, okay? We just can't handle that stuff anymore. But if Jason Cooley preaches out in the street a hundred times, 99.5 of those times, nobody's going to hear a word he says. Does that mean he's not doing the right thing? No, I believe he is. But when those people stand before a holy God and say, but, 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 but God's going to say, remember Jason Cooley? Remember that guy you spit on? Remember that guy you called the police on? Remember that guy you called a racist hater? That guy you despise, he said, I sent him. He had my word in his mouth, and he gave you my word, and you rejected it. Depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I knew you not. The world's going to hear. Whether they want to hear it or not, they're going to hear. The sad of it is, God will have us preach in ways and in places where people are going to do nothing but reject it. But still and yet, that is the will of God. As heartbreaking as it is. I mean, we want to do this because we love people want to see them saved. We want people to have the same chance we did, come before God. And you know what? Yeah, you'll find one, maybe two, maybe others. Okay? But my one-time street preaching in Kenya, I was glad that three people got saved. But I know I had to be talking to at least 150. So 147 people rejected the word of God that night. Puts it in a different perspective, doesn't it? But that was what God told me to do. Okay? So we're the Bible now. We're the Bible. They're going to read the Bible in our lives God's going to manifest, that's what he says, manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. It means God's going to make it known that that's who you are. So quit trying to hide who you are. Quit trying to pretend that you're something else in front of everybody else and then pretend you're another thing when you're around your church friends. Okay, That's been done a billion times by a billion other people. Let it not be done by you. But the truth of it is, God has manifested his word in your life and in your heart, and it's written there, and other people are going to read it. Will they get saved? That's up to God. Will they perish? That's their decision. It's their choice. They can accept it or lose it. Exodus 24, verse 7. The Bible says he took the book of the covenant, read in the audience of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said Will we do and be obedient? So now Moses is giving them the book of the covenant. It's, it's in its written form. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And so they, so when Moses offered them this covenant, it was a covenant of do these commandments and live. And they said, we promise we will keep thine commandments. And they didn't. Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people. Uh, the New Testament says he sprinkled the book also. And behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. And so Moses then is the mediator of the written covenant, the written contract written down by Moses himself. And it's in writing, so there's no disputing over it. And Israel agreed. That that's the contract that they were going to accept. The one they were going to live by. It's like 
uh, let's say you and your wife, you and your husband went out, you bought something and you said, well, we'll make payments on it. When you first bought it, you may have legitimately felt like you were able to make the payments on it. Then in, you didn't know that six months later, he was going to lose his job or she was going to get fired or there would be some catastrophe and all their money had to go toward medical bills. And now all of a sudden, they signed off on a contract to make payments on something that they can't make payments on anymore because they don't have the money. The people that signed a contract with you, do you think that they'll understand your particular situation in life and say, oh, you poor thing, we'll, we'll write this off. Fat chance. You're headed to a collections agency. Okay? Uh, but because you signed a written contract, and you can go over that contract with a fine-tooth comb, but there is no way you're getting out of that loan. You have to pay it off or declare bankruptcy. So, in the case of you and your sins, you filed bankruptcy with God. You said, God, I have all these sins, and I can't pay them off. What am I going to do? Tell God thank you that he's merciful because his son paid it off for you. Freely, I might add. Amen? So which is better? In 21st century America, which is better? Is it better to have a handshake and a verbal agreement or a written contract? written contract why brother George can't trust anyone let God be true and a man a liar I remember we bought a car for a young boy that was basically dumped in our lap because his mom had to go to prison and we helped him buy a car his first car and the guy made all kinds of promises to us and it was a piece of junk. When I called the guy back, he said, sorry, it's how you bought it. Wasn't a thing I could do about it, and I knew it. I couldn't have taken him to court. We didn't have, we didn't have there was nothing in writing where he guaranteed that this car would be good for another 30 days. He just said, yeah, it's a good car. And I believed him. So, we lost that one, okay? And I've been burned by people before who made promise, verbal promises to me. And you just don't do that anymore with people. If it's in writing, then you have proof this is what they said they would do and they're not doing it. So it's better to have it written down. This is why you don't have to trust anybody who after A.D. 96, let's say, after John died, you don't have to trust and listen to anybody who says, God told me this. If he did, show it to me in here and I will believe you. Oh, not everything that God says is in the Bible. In fact, there's a whole chapter of the Gospel of John still in heaven waiting for us to to know about one of these days. Okay? People believe that, Sterling. Thousands of people believe stuff exactly like that all the time. And the latter day prophets, they don't have to be Mormons. They can be Pentecostal, charismatic, they can even be Lutheran. It doesn't matter. People will lie about things that they say God said. This is why we have it written down for us. And you stick with that. No matter who tells you God said this, you stick with what's written down. And if you can't trust what's in writing, then who can you trust? So it's like with us, it's either this Bible or where are we going to go? There's no place else and nothing else for us to tell these people what you did for two years after you watched the first Mike Hoggard video. I sat with my Bible, my King James Bible on my lap, and I waited to hear something come out of his mouth that was different from what I read. And if I did, I wasn't going to listen to him because I thought he was lying. So I was using the word to make sure he was lying. 
I'm, I can just picture you sitting in your living room in your jammies for two straight years, <laughs> smelling and everything, waiting for me to say something wrong. And it, now, it's not that I am right on everything. But if I'm reading this book, I'm not wrong. And you're not either for reading it. That's the thing. If it's in this book, then that's how we're going to live. This is our contract with God. This is God's contract with us, given to us by the mediator, Jesus Christ. And the sad part of it is, you still have people in churches everywhere looking in other places. This really is the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. Because they're looking for God to speak to them and they've stripped over God's written word to do it and they never find it. What a shame. Amen? What a shame. So the ministry of this church and other churches just like us is to present to mankind the written record of the word of God. And if they reject that one, then they've rejected God. Amen? Amen.